Hello and welcome back to the ROI podcast, the podcast that's obsessed with the art and science of return on investment. Disclaimer, nothing that we say here today is to be construed as advice of any kind. It's two guys having a chat about one subsector sector that we really, really like, and that is oil services, particularly offshore so services. My guest today, he's back, Tommy Deepwater, uh, super, super interesting guy. Make sure you're following his work on Twitter. And without further ado, Tommy, I would love to welcome you back to the podcast. Thanks for joining me. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing well. Um, thank you for inviting me back. It's a pleasure and uh, excited to talk with you about you know what's happened since we last spoke. Pleasure is mine. Guys, if you haven't already liked and subscribed to the channel, would greatly appreciate you doing so. It doesn't cost you anything, but it does help out the algorithm. So please do like and subscribe to the channel and like and follow Tommy on Twitter. So let's pick it up right there. What, in your opinion, has been the most important or significant news development in the services slash offshore space since we spoke last. I'd be interested to get your take on things. Yeah, so I think, um, ironically, I, I think that the lack of news and the slow development has been kind of the most newsworthy thing as it relates to um, offshore driller progress. Um, I think that all, all, the, all the, you know, the trends are still positive on this. There's actually been a lot of very exciting um, exploration activity that's been successful, which um, doesn't impact the driller market um, so much today. Um, but longer term, when those are development projects, you know, hopefully a few years out, like that's going to be really positive. But um, I think the most newsworthy thing has just been it's been slow progress. I think that in the offshore drilling market, it is a very long cycle type of market and um, I also used to cover um, U.S. onshore services like um, frac sand companies, um, pressure pumpers, land drillers. That market just moves so fast. If you, if you have um, some wells that you want to drill, you can go do it pretty quickly um, and then complete them and it starts producing. Um, and offshore, you know, it takes years um, when you consider all the pieces of equipment. You're 100 miles off the coast. Um, and... Um, you know, it, it's not just the drillers, it, it's not just the drilling rig that you need. You need to have, um, subsea equipment. So like Technip FMC and subsea seven, like the stuff that goes on, on the bottom of the, um, seafloor, um, you know, you have to arrange all of that. You need an FPSO, like a floating production storage offloading unit. Um, so there's just a lot of things that need to come together for these development programs to happen. And some of the comments that have been made on, um, the conference calls, which, you know, I love listening to, I, you, you learn a lot, um, has been, um, we're seeing a trend of longer term contracts that are in the market. Those are, those are contracts that, um, haven't found, or those are being put up for bid for work, you know, commencing at, at the end of 2024 or 2025. Um, a lot of those projects are longer term. They might have three to five year uh, terms on them. And one of the things that they had noted was they tend to take longer to negotiate the longer term. That might sound like an excuse, but when you consider everything that needs to um, be coordinated in doing an offshore oil development program, um, which is not exploration, exploration, it's you really just need like OSVs and um, a drilling rig. But when you're actually doing production and you're going to be you know, um, building, you know, a, a few hundred thousand barrel a day oil project. There's just a lot of things that need to come together and it's more regulated. The engineering is more challenging. Um, it just takes time. And, you know, I, I, I think people, um, you kind of have to be patient with some of these things, but, um, when you see the trends, um, in terms of where the CapEx is flowing from the big oil companies, um, these are some of the best investments that they have, and um, they're they're going ahead with them, um, absent the oil market just completely tanking and oil prices going sustainably below sixty. But um, yeah, so I would say probably since we last spoke, it was uh, the lack of of news has been the most important item, and you, you've seen um, people sell sell the stocks. I mean, I think the performance has not been great. They actually have rebounded recently. Um, 
but I think it's just a little bit of impatience um, with the long cycle nature of this market. Yeah, it's certainly been amazing to me to see some of the sentiment around um, these, particularly the drillers, I think is the, the one, because for the fact, as you mentioned, there are so many moving parts that need to be in place and that's not going to happen overnight. Talk me through the contracts in terms of, you mentioned, I, I believe three years have been the term signed. What sort of day rates are we talking? Because for people uh, like me, the thesis is simple these day rates have to get to somewhere around 635,000 a day before we get the thesis ruined by an influx of new rigs being built. If that will still be the case in three to five years, the goalposts may change. Where are we at in terms of day rates currently? Who's contracting the rigs and, and which rigs are being contracted? Yeah, um, so... <clears throat> Uh, the day rates in the market, so there are different types of floating rigs. Um, the ones that people pay most attention to are the 7G drill ships. That's the majority of the market. Um, we've seen contracts announced um, in, in recent months, anywhere between 480 and 499,000. Um, Noble had an announcement in the Philippines, uh, which you don't see a lot of drill ships. I think that was a higher day rate deal because I don't think there was a lot of drill ships in the mar in that particular area. But the Gulf of Mexico has recently seen um, day rates um, for 7Gs of 480, um, 470, 480, and then I think we've seen one around 490, so that's kind of where the market is there. Um, the terms, when I say the, the lack of development, or at least the, the lack of progress in the market, um, we've heard rumors for a while about longer term tenors out there for development projects. That will be three to five years. Um, we haven't seen a whole lot of announcements on those projects yet. Um, if you go through and you look at what these companies are saying, the big IOCs, international oil companies, um, they talk about commencement of some projects in you know Nigeria, Angola, um, Petrobras in Brazil, um, with commencement in the second half of uh, 2024 and more so in 2025. Um, so as it relates to the day rates, I, I think that the 7G um, drill ship is in the upper 400 range. Now, um, once you start seeing some of these longer tenor contracts, like five years, um, what some of these companies have been saying has been that the longer the tenor, you might see a discount on the day rate. So a 7G might be at 485 currently, but and that might be a one, two, or maybe three year contract. But if you go out to five years, there might be more of a discount on that. And the term white space has been kind of negative that has been brought up in the market recently. And um, that is basically, if you look at like one of the drillers um, fleet status reports is uncontracted time. So there's become an aversion to having uncontracted time on your um, fleet status report. So um, some of the drillers might find it, uh, might be incentivized to take a discount on the day rate. I don't know what that discount is. Um, there's still some price discovery on that, but that might be, I don't know, low to four to mid $400,000 range to get a five-year tenor. And that can make a lot of sense today to, for those drillers, just because they're locking up hundred percent utilization for five years. And that can provide some value to drillers that might have um, the ability to repurchase shares at a large discount to replacement value. And I can understand the rationale that some of the drillers might have if they were giving up some day rate um, to lock in for five years, 100% utilization. So um, yeah, that was still that more was to be, be a, developed on that. Yeah, It was going to be a question of mine to say, well, is it really in the uh, in the best interest of the drillers to do that or should they do we've seen uh i believe the best performers i know it's osvs but uh, tidewater has really shot uh, through the roof this year based on the fact that it has very short-term uh, contracting and that allows them to roll over more quickly into higher and higher uh, rate environment but you're saying well you can have a bit of a trade-off between getting to that higher day rate if it means you've got uh, a certainty of contract backlog that, I suppose, from a sector perspective, really tightens the fleet and gets us closer to that saturation point. And then eventually 
we'll get to that point where the contracts go to roll over and there's just not the availability of rigs and we get this squeeze that we're all kind of hoping for. At interim, they can buy back their own stock. Have I summarized that kind of correctly? You did a great job, Benjamin. No, that's exactly right. And I think that you see different strategies with different drillers. Um, so, uh, you know, Valeris and Sea Drill are um, offshore drillers that um, have active share repurchase programs currently, and they might find it. They have commented before that they kind of value utilization. You know, this is what they've said on one of their conference calls. Um, so, you know, they might have a strategy where it's like, hey, look, our stock is cheap. We can, you know, lock in a day rate in the $400,000 range for five years. That gives them some protection if the market goes lower. And it also gives them free cash flow to buy back their shares, which are at a significant discount to replacement value. So that makes sense to some investors. And um, that's more of a conservative style. I would say some of the other drillers, Transocean is one of them, um, where they don't really value utilization. They're more price sensitive. And while they might not be taking, they might, you know, I mean, they are, they're withholding um, drill ship supply um, because they want higher day rates. And if someone else is willing to bid at a lower day rate today, I think that it might be disappointing to them in the short term, but longer term, um, it, you know, um, in 2026, 2027, um, they've got that availability. And if the market has, um, has grown as expected, um, then they will have a lot of pricing power because, you know, those contract, those, those drill ships that are available today um, have been signed up on five-year contracts and they don't have to bid against them anymore. So um, that gets to the point where they can be um, have demonstrate some more pricing power and really force uh, day rates to go higher. Um, but you are taking some risk in that, um, in that, that the market doesn't go south, um, you know, in 2026. I think that pretty much everything that we see and as long as um, I, you know, honestly, I think the greatest risk to this um, whole bull thesis on offshore is really OPEC. And if they really want to crush the market, um, they potentially can do that. And when I say that, that's not them releasing extra barrels when oil is at $80 a barrel. That's them like forcibly being very aggressive, um, such as they were in November of 2014, and just flooding the market with as much oil as they can and pushing prices lower. Uh, everything that OPEC has done, OPEC plus has done recently is that they're not interested in that strategy. Um, but there, that geopolitical risk is in the market. And, um, if you're somebody that is waiting for pricing power, um, you do, you do take that duration risk in terms of, um, uh, uh, what the market is like in 2025, 2026, you just don't know. And what the price of oil is going to be and appetite might be strong today to do these investments, but it might not be in the future. Um, I'm bullish on this stuff. So um, uh, I, I don't see a whole lot of signs as it relates. I mean, I, honestly, in terms of looking at where the CapEx is going, I spend a lot of time on the EMPs because um, their CapEx is is the cash flows of the drillers once they sign up for them. So um, I see, I see growing CapEx in these offshore projects that are honestly are some of the highest returning investments that are on their investment menu. Um, so I feel okay. confident um, that we're, that we're headed or that we're in a positive direction, although this is the oil market and uh, you know, it's just volatility. And especially if you're in oil field services, you know, you're getting even more beta on, on oil prices. So um, there was risk involved, but there's definitely different strategies from the different drillers and, you know, it's uh, different strokes for different folks. Some people like, you know, one strategy and some people like the other. Absolutely. I've got, uh, before we move into that, uh, that E&P side of things, I, I think everything that OPEC has done it has been pretty consistent in terms of what they're going to uh, or how they're going to play. They've been cutting rather than flooding. And there seems to be a, a decent amount of solidarity amongst the, the member nations. I want to, it's funny that you just mentioned that a, a light bulb went off in my head that it's almost like Transocean's playing the long game. And if with the strategy that the, that its competitors are, are doing in terms of locking up, taking some, some day rate discount, but locking up the term, when we do eventually get to the end of that term, it's almost like their competitors are doing the work for them in terms of uh, taking away any competition. 
when they go to re-sign those day rates. The question is, can they survive in mid four hundred uh, mid four hundreds uh, until then? What's the liquidity profile like of Transocean? Yeah, that's always that's always so, been the question. <laughs> I know the people ask that question. I'm a bond. I'm a credit person. Um, I I kind of um, I, I do not worry about it. Um, I've posted numerous times on Twitter. I hate to be repetitive and say the same things over and over again because I think there's a lot of a lot more other interesting things to say. I need you to, to I, need I need to hear it. I need to. Hear it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. I'm glad to talk about it, but it's just you know, there's. I'd rather talk about Namibia exploration or something. Oh, we will. Um, but I know we will. Oh, I'm not. I'm not complaining about you, but other people no, um, are, are are criticizing Transocean and they're. Um, yeah. Hey, look. I mean, they have a, they they have a lot of debt. Um, some of their debt um, also has principal amortization tied to it. Um, it has interest rates um, as well, interest expense tied to it. Um, this industry, um, you know, um, does generate a lot of free cash flow. And I, I personally don't think there's an issue as it relates to liquidity with Transocean. I think that um, and this can always change. And this is my opinion. And please don't take this as investment advice. Um, but um I think they have a lot of different avenues for liquidity. Um, they have some unencumbered rigs, some really high quality rigs, um, high spec rigs that are not pledged as collateral currently on any of their bonds. So if they wanted to go to the secured bond market, which they've done numerous times before, and these bonds are well bid in the corporate bond market, um, they can go and pledge you know, one, two, maybe three of these rigs to a bond and go out there and raise 300, 400. If you pledged all three, you could probably get over a billion dollars in liquidity. And yeah, that's, that's extra debt um, that they're going to have to pay on. And, 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 you know, it's kind of kicking the can down the road as it relates to deleveraging, which they want to do. But um, that is a really low cost of capital source of liquidity for them if they really need it. And they have that in their back pocket if they need it. Um, I don't think that they do. Um, they also have a revolving credit facility that is very over collateralized, in my opinion. It's about a five, I think it's a $600 million senior secured credit facility. They've got like eight, 11 rigs um, collateralizing that. And some of those aren't their best rigs, but some of them are. And um, I think that, you know, I, I, I think that. Um, they have a lot of different avenues that they can go as it relates to pledging their um, their rigs um, for additional debt. And I, I don't think they need to issue um, uh, equity, which would be a lot higher cost of capital. Um, that will always be open to them if they need to do it. But obviously, um, issuing uh, secured debt um, is much cheaper to them. And that market is definitely open for them. Um, as we speak here today. Yeah, when you you cleared that up for me last time, I was like, okay, now I really start to I really start to see where this is going. 11, 11 rigs collateralizing such a small amount. Is there any chance they can refinance that? Can they renegotiate that and free yeah. up some, some more rigs for Yeah, I, I yeah, I mean, well, I don't want to get into too much in debt advisory and stuff like that, but um I think that much that that's a um a, a bank credit facility where a lot of different banks are, are participating in that. Um, I think that they could um, uh, release some of those rigs. Um, I don't know the specifics and I, I don't, I'm just, I'm just somebody sitting at a desk, looking at their 10 K, looking at their rigs, looking at the liquidity and what I think can happen. Um, I think they have a lot of flexibility. Um, and as these rigs start to, the, you know, when they negotiated that credit facility, um, uh, day rates were a lot lower and the market's really improved a lot since then. So I think that they can work with the banks and I gotta be honest. I mean, I work in the credit markets also too. And, uh, I see a lot, I mean, the private credit markets are, are open. I don't think that they need to go there, but at least in the U S dollar credit markets, non-investment grade, there's a lot of, um, things that you can do. And I think that Transocean doesn't need to um, do anything that crazy. I think that everything that they've done so far, um, just these secured bond um, issuances, and then also to um, uh, collateralize credit facilities are, are adequate for them. And I think they continue to be available for them on 
on, on better terms going forward as, as they've demonstrated uh, significant improvement in their business over recent years. The Transocean Management, if you happen to be listening to this, uh, call my man, Tommy Deepwater. You can, <laughs> you can do your good deal on refining. Oh, I don't, I don't think they need, I don't think they want to hear from me, but <laughs> no, well, I, I'll give I it a discount, I, I discount, discount code, discount code. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's fantastic. Before we uh, before we uh, move on to Namibia and the exploration side of things, which we both want to talk about, we've got to settle this this Twitter debate amongst the bros. It's Rig versus Valaris. Rig <laughs> versus Valaris, which is better? It's almost like you know that um, is it Happy Gilmore or Billy Madison? Where everywhere he's like, shampoo is better, conditioner is better. No, shampoo is better. <laughs> this is what this is what I look at these. Uh, these buffoons on Twitter arguing some of the silliest things. I just want to get your your quick take. Rig versus Valaris. Why not both? Um, you, you could do both if you wanted to. Um, I, I personally, I'm just going to respect people's opinions um, on this because there's just different strategies. Um, ultimately, like uh, they're in the same business. Um, their assets are roughly the same. I think Transocean has more of a diversified fleet. Um, they have some of these 8G drill ships um, that are, um, it's a newer technology, um, but that is very differentiated. They kind of have control of that market. And that's really just being used in the Gulf of Mexico today. Um, we haven't seen a whole lot of news on that. There's actually... Um, um, one of the rigs, the Atlas, had their contract extended at a mid four hundred thousand dollar day rate recently, um, which was negative news. I think the stock sold off on that, but um, I think that twenty k market um, on eight G drill ships is um, is interesting, and no other drillers have that um, technology. It, there's one of them. There's a there's a company called Stena that has um, one rig that has that, and they're working in the Gulf currently, but. Um, um, I think it just depends on, on, on what you like. If, if you like Transocean is more beta, they have a more aggressive strategy as it relates to contracting out. They don't want to contract for utilization. They want to get the best price. And with that, that's more of a volatile um, strategy. Um, they withhold supply into the market, um, which um, um, is, is kind of helping um, some of the others find utilization if, if they if they want it in terms of bidding into contracts. Uh, Transocean obviously has the debt. So um, whenever people are not agreeing with the offshore thesis or are starting to doubt it, people start to talk about bankruptcy. I'm not worried about that, um, but I can I do know other people um, do worry about that. Um, so you have that natural higher beta in Transocean. Valaris is less beta. Their contracting strategy um, is balanced. We actually haven't seen a whole lot as it relates to um, being undisciplined on their end. I think we've seen some contract announcements that um, have been within the market roughly. So I think they're being a disciplined operator. Um, they have the share buyback program. So because they don't have a lot of debt, they don't have, um, they have more free cash flow than Transocean does, for instance. So they can go into the market and repurchase shares. Um, so um, it's just different strategies. And um, I think Transocean ultimately has a larger diversified fleet. Um, some of the rigs are lower quality, um, but they also have a lot, um, the HE drill ships and then the Norwegian eligible ultra deep water semi submersibles. I love those. Um, that market's really strong. Um, Valeris doesn't have those, but um, Valeris does have a lot of very high quality 7G drill ships that can work in um, the Gulf of Mexico, the West Coast of Africa, and um, in Latin America as well. And um, they also have the jackups as well. So Transocean doesn't have the jackups business. Um, that's not something that I focus on a whole lot. Um, um, that's been a market that I haven't um, covered directly, um, but that's more of a stable market. That's more of a resilient market. Transocean sold their jackups um, maybe a decade ago, if not longer. So they, they're completely deep water drilling, which is more volatile. It's more beta. And Laris has the jackup rig. So I would say it depends on how much how much beta you want to have and what types of strategy you, you want to go with. If you are more aggressive then Transocean might be a better fit for you. If 
you like the Sherry purchase story and higher utilization, maybe Valeris works for you as well. So um, I'll leave it. There's different strategies and some people can like one thing. It's just, you know, it's like, what do you like on your pizza? Do you like pepperoni yeah. or do you like mushrooms? You know, I think it so. tells you, I think it tells us a little bit more about the actual investor or speculator than the, the theses in, in and of themselves. Because I, I look back at 21 and you know, some of the, some of the things I did with regard to Transocean, I look back now and I think, Jesus Christ, did I actually do that? Uh, and it all worked out, <laughs> it all worked out very well. But uh, right now it just like Valaris is very simple to understand. Um, I know people say, well, if you believe in the thesis of the sector and Valaris, then you have to believe in rig because you know, you have to get to that, that, that pricing point in the end. Uh, and, and I do understand that, but it's, a, it's, like the, the emotions are real and you've got to, you've got to stomach a lot of volatility. And I think that, you know, we all need to do a bit of a gut check sometimes to see uh, if we have the sleep at night factor. And if God's, if God's listening, uh, a beautiful end to this uh, bull market would be you get in with Valaris, they buy back, bid up their own stock, and then you get a relative, um, you get a relative undervaluation of Transocean towards that end of the cycle inflection point. And then uh, you move it on, but hey, we things don't always work out so well. That's that's a reasonable timeline that you just laid out there. I can I can see that. Yep, well I hope said. so. I hope so. I hope so too. I know <laughs> there can be. It's easier said than done. I I you know, I, um, you know, it's a volatile industry, and sometimes you know you can really question yourself. You see some of these stocks, and they're just going lower. And that's the one thing too. Um, a big difference between Valeris and Rig is. Um, rig has been, you know, it, that stock traded really heavy. Um, you know, that stock just fell, fell, fell. They don't, they don't have a sherry purchase program. So, you know, when everybody's selling their, they don't have it yet. Um, I think that they need to start paying down some debt before they can get that flexibility to start buying back their stock and paying dividends. But, you know, that price support that Valeris had, um, um, to buy back their stock in a, in a downturn is, is something also to you that provides that some people can value as well. So it's just more volatility on Transocean. Yeah. Correct me if you, if I'm wrong or if you disagree, there seems to be good support, let's call it for Val stock around that kind of 60 mark. Um, it seems to be, if it's getting down there that whether, it, whether or not it is the company themselves that are buying back stock on the open market, uh, you have more of that support, whereas as you mentioned with transaction, there's no there's no safety net. Uh, if you get a sell off, you you just have to stomach the volatility. Yep, exactly. Easier said than done. Sometimes when you see that stock go lower, it's just you know emotions can can get the better of you, and you know it's just it's a sleep at night factor. Sometimes um, you really just have to trust it. Sometimes you're just better off not looking at the stock prices every day. Just focus on the the fundamentals, and you know hopefully longer term it'll play out, but easier said than done yeah it all it always is uh, speaking of emotions something that gets you and i very emotional in a good way is the exploration story off the coast of namibia educate me i don't know a lot about this why is namibia such a big deal who's operating there in terms of the emp and who on the services side stands to benefit from this very very interesting development story No, good questions. I'm just making sure that I'm writing this down. Yeah, so why Namibia? Um, I think that's been, that's been, um, so if you look at um, Guyana currently, that's, that's the big growth market that's getting a lot of attention because Exxon, Chevron, and Hess are involved in um, some transactions related to um, the agreements off the coast in, in Guyana which has been a, a massive success story as it relates to offshore drilling and production. That was an oil find in 2015. I believe they started producing their first oil in 2019, 2020. And um, today I think they're up to about four, maybe 500,000 barrels per day. And in another two years, I think they'll be at um, or above a million barrels per day. And those are very economic investments for all of the operators. So it's been, um, it's been Exxon Hess. I'm speaking about Guyana, Guyana, um, yes. Exxon Hess and um, CNUC, which is a Chinese uh, oil company that have have invested a lot of money there, but their returns are excellent and there continues to be more growth. Um, that's more of a benign environment in Guyana. Um, it, when I say that, I mean, like it's 
um, it's a drill ship market. There's a lot of rigs that are out there. It's not very harsh conditions to go out and drill there. Um, Namibia is very interesting just because it's kind of, um, it's a harsh environment market. And you hear that term sometimes in offshore drilling where, you know, generally it's like the North Sea in Norway um, is, is been the largest um, harsh environment market. Uh, Namibia is a very unique geology. It's, it's a place that's, it's, it's not like low hanging fruit. It's not the first place that you would choose to go drill um, just because it tends to be um, deeper water there that compared to Guyana. And also to the currents are just a lot more complicated. So drill ships, um, which are the most common um, types of uh, floating rigs, they don't work as well there. Um, you will see them um, work there, but they can kind of get put out of commission due to challenging um, weather conditions. And instead you see these ultra deep water, harsh environment, semi-submersible rigs, which are my favorite. I really like those. Um, those are designed to go work in Norway in harsh conditions. And they started to migrate their way down to Namibia and also South Africa as well as, is an area that's not um, getting as much exploration activity, but it will in 2025 and 2026. Um, we've seen massive oil finds. Well, um, <laughs> I think some of the companies, uh, so Total Energies and Shell are the ones that made very large discoveries. Total did the Venus well. Um, I believe, you know, it was about a year, two years ago, um, Shell had the graph discovery. These are very large, like headline grabbing um, oil discoveries that are very large. Um, they have been later to be drilling there just because it's more harsh environment to go drill there. It's not the, the first place that you would choose to go drilling, but now we have these very um, high spec, highly capable drilling rigs where we can start drilling there. You know, probably 20 years ago, it was more difficult to go drill there efficiently. Um, but today we have the technology to go do it. So uh, we've had large discovery. We've continued to see discoveries off the coast of Namibia. And we've recently seen a company called Galp Energia, which is a Portuguese oil company. They've been drilling in their own block and they started drilling in January and they have indicated success. Um, as it relates to their drilling activities of the Mopane 1 and Mopane 2 exploration wells. Um, we don't have a lot of details on that yet. Um, they haven't commented as it relates to um, the commerciality yet. But however, like I started talking about Guyana here first, and um, I go back and I read all the, all the press releases from Hess Corporation, which is the smaller of the operators. You go look at all of their discoveries that they announced um, in, in Guyana, um, and I think that Gallup is kind of saying some of the similar things where they're talking about, you know, um, very high pressure, very high permeability, very high porosity, all that type of stuff. Um, so it, it's very early and it's, it's exploration and it might not be successful, but there's been very interesting discoveries going on there. And there continues to be more exploration going on in Namibia. Chevron is going to start drilling there. Presumably they don't have a rig yet. However, they, you know, I, I think they'd be crazy not to do exploration considering they're right next to these other major oil discoveries. Um, they should start to, uh, drilling in the fourth quarter of 2024 or in 2025. We'll see on the timing. Deepwater tends to get delayed on things. So just, you know, bake in an extra quarter for delay. Um, and then Woodside Energy. Um, also, too, has an option to start drilling in more of a northern region compared to where Galp is. Um, so it's, it's very exciting in terms of um, the drilling and uh, exploration. The reason why I look at all of this stuff is because I'm trying to, um, I know what's going on in some parts of the world with uh, drilling rig demand, but I'm trying to model out drilling rig demand. And it's like, how many rigs is this market going to need? Um, because this market is, is tightening up. There still is some excess capacity as it relates to floating drilling rigs, but you need to know like what's going on in the exploration basins. And uh, Namibia could be a very large oil discovery that would require, there's currently four drilling rigs that are there. One of them's leaving for Canada very shortly. Um, what, type but, of, what type of rigs are we talking down there? So those are, so there's three, that are ultra deep water, harsh environment, semi-subs. 
Um, there is one um, drill ship that Total is using. They can also operate there. However, those need, there are certain specifications. It's, it's a higher end drill ship that's capable of working there. Um, um, it's not ideal. Um, you'd really want to have the um, ultra deep water, harsh environment semi subs doing that work, but there's not enough of them. I was just um, about to say that from my kind of putting together replacement valuations for these companies, how many semi subs are there left? I mean, I think Val's got five, and I don't know if they're the harsh environment. I don't think they are. Yeah, yeah, so are around. Yeah, so um, it's it's a smaller market and. Um, the semi subs are um, there's there's a lot of differences amongst them in drill ships. It's like oh here's a six G, here's a seven G. Um, maybe there's a couple eight Gs out there, um, but in semi subs they're all very different. Um, I like to categorize them by the ones that can work in Norway and the ones that can't. So Norway has very high standards as it relates to um, um, these types of semi subs that can work there. Um, that's the market, Norway, which is also growing, by the way. Like if you listen to Equinor and Bar Energy, they're growing their exploration activity, which means they're going to need more rigs. So, and they're going to need those, those Norway eligible semi-subs. I don't have a hard number for you, um, but as it relates to the Norwegian eligible ones, it's in the low 20s. I think there's 23, 24-ish um, that are capable and um, three of those have migrated to Namibia. Um, a few of those have migrated to Australia. Um, and one or two of them are, are going potentially, one of them at least is going to Canada, which is another harsh environment market. So um, yeah, that market is, um, if, you know, I, I will say we, we speak a lot about Transocean and Valeris. And I hesitate to say this because I mispronounced the name last time I was on your podcast, but it's it this is. Norwegian driller. Oddfell, and they are the ones that own some very high quality, ultra deep water, harsh environment, semi-submersible rigs. I love them. I think they're great assets. Um, that company is like hundred percent utilized and day rates are going higher on those types of rigs. So that market is a lot tighter than the drill ship market. Part of that reason is because Namibia has, has grown and it has a growing demand. Also the semi-subs weren't as overbuilt um, in the last building cycle as drill ships have been. So you're starting to see the semi-subs, um, um, that market is recovering faster than drill ships. So all of the demand drivers are, are, are pulling up demand for floating rigs, um, but there's just excess supply of the drill ships. I think that they just built a little bit too many of them, but um, that the market is absorbing them and um, yeah, we're going to continue to follow that. That's super interesting. I've learned a lot already about the semis. I, I admit I kind of discounted the semi thesis because I I was purely thinking in terms of water depth and drilling depth. And I thought, well, why are you going to go with a semi if you just get this big drill ship? But you're telling me it depends on the harshness of the environment. And that is where you have an advantage for these semis over, say, the drill ships. In addition to which, there's far less of these things like um, floating around than there are drill ships. Is that somewhere close to correct? Yeah, you're good. You're good with the summaries, Benjamin. Yep, I agree. Okay, I like it. Uh, so Namibia, fascinating. What about, uh, and you don't have to comment if you don't want to, but there's a company that I follow and I can't understand why it doesn't get enough attention. And that's BW Energy, evolved in exploration in some... Uh, tricky jurisdictions, let's call them. Uh, do you follow BW Energy at all? I don't follow it as closely as you, um, but they do have um, some exploration in Namibia. So as it relates to um, the, um, offshore Namibia, um, I mentioned Total, Shell, Galp, Woodside. Um, there's also some smaller companies that have their own blocks. BW has one as well. Um, it's, they don't have a rig lined up currently. They had mentioned that they're going to, they're, they're ordering, um, long cycle types of equipment for developing. I don't know what exactly that means. They've said that publicly, um, BW also, I think I'm going to be careful what I say, because I don't know this company as well as I think you do, but 
I think they also have an FPSO, um, which they own and maybe they lease out. Um, that's a growing market. I don't exactly know their ownership status on that or what they do specifically, but um, it's kind of a smaller um, underfollowed company. I, I get very excited about the upside in Namibia and with BW, I think that they're a little bit further along from drilling. Um, you might make an argument as well that their exploration block in Namibia might be more gassy. Um, but, um, I gotta be careful. I'm not hundred percent certain on that. Um, so no, no one is, sir. that's why they call it exploration. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, that's exciting. I just want somebody pulling this up like a year from now and be like, hey, you know, you said this and you were way wrong. So um, it's that's, an interesting thing. That's going to happen anyway, whether, whether you were right or wrong. <laughs> people, people will just create narratives in their own mind. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm, lo I'm loving the discussion. Uh, unless you have anything to add about the, the Namibia or offshore space, I thought it might be interesting to make a few comments around some things happening on land. In particular, this news, recent news around the Trans Mountain Pass, I believe it's going to be opening and functioning in May. That's what I understand. Uh, you have spent some time in the past looking at Canadian um, EMPs and refiners, as have I. I don't know about you. I've been frustrated after an initial win. I was kind of frustrated now with um, Canadian players. Do you... Do you still like this thesis? And what do you think about the, the Trans Mountain Pass in terms of implications of closing the difference between Canadian oil price and uh, WTI? Yeah, that's that's been important. Um, as an American, I, I wish that we would support um, uh, our, our Canadian partners in Alberta with the oil sands, um, the Keystone XL pipeline. I mean, that's a, that's a decent amount of heavy oil in Alberta. And that oil is best refined in the Gulf coast. Like we have all these refineries that were built to, to refine heavy, sour crude from Venezuela. You know, we don't really import that much from Venezuela anymore. And there's all of this, um, Alberta heavy oil, um, that's there that I wish that we would support. Um, so that's been a real challenge as it relates to takeaway capacity longer term. I know that that's not any new story, but, um, more takeaway capacity from Alberta and narrowing that difference from uh, WTI, uh, WCS. I mean, it theoretically all SQL, it should work. Um, uh, now WTI is a different type of crude than, than WCS. That's the, the heavy, the heavy oil uh, crude slate. Um, I, I really like the Canadian oil sands companies. Um, largely because they have so many reserves. Um, if you just go look at proven reserve, proven reserve life, you know, whether it's Canadian natural, Sonovus, Suncor, I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of other Canadian oil companies. I don't follow them as closely because I tend to focus on the offshore, you know, companies that are doing exploration wells in Namibia is tends to be my focus and not the Canadian ones as much anymore, but, um, that is a, um, geopolitically very safe area. And they have a certain type of crude oil that honestly, I, I think the market needs more of. Um, so more, what, is, more... what is the difference? In, why is Canadian heavy so important in your eyes? A lot of people discount it. They don't like it as much. What's what's so good about well, Canadian crude? Yeah, so it, it trades at a discount because it's harder to refine. So I, you know, it's been a while since I've covered the refineries, but um the heavy sour crude oil is like corrosive to refining equipment. And there's a Nelson complexity score um, for these refineries. And the higher that score, the more different types of crude oil that they can refine. And it's cheaper um, to build a refinery, not that anyone's building these, but um, anymore um, outside of China. Um, it's it, it, it's just easier to refine light sweet crude. So it always trades at a premium. More refineries can refine it. Um, the, the different types, there's more expensive refineries that have the capability to refine heavy sour. If you can buy that at a discount, which they normally trade at a discount, you know, if, I don't know, a couple of barrels, but you know, when you, when you refine as many barrels as the, these refineries do, that really, really helps your margins. Um, it's just getting access to that heavy sour and the infrastructure 
that's needed and you know pipelines i mean they used to take this stuff down on, on rail um you know from from alberta down to to the gulf coast or different parts that's just a very inefficient way to transport crude and i kind of just wish i don't want to get off onto a policy rant but i kind of wish we would um, support um, infrastructure particularly with um, um with our friends across the globe um so it would make it, it would make more sense than turning a blind eye to Iranian crude uh, magically yeah. appearing on floating storage. But anyway, <laughs> well, and, and on that topic, you know, if you want to talk about because we've talked about um, Guyana, um, but Venezuela, I mean, Venezuela is, is a producer of heavy crude. And um, I think that the heavy crude you can man i'm gonna sound stupid on this i i don't know the specifics anymore but i think there's more things that you can do with it there are certain types of petroleum products that um, you can get out of heavy crude that you can't get as much from on the light sweet and there's just so much light sweet because that's most of what the shale production is um, that you see in the united states um, but venezuela um this is a big geopolitical thing but as it relates to um you know, we don't really, the United States is actually, I think we're actually buying some of that Venezuelan crude, small amounts of it. Um, at the same time, you know, they're not being very democrat, uh, um, democratic with their elections. They're threatening Guyana um, as it relates to like all their oil production and taking over parts of the country. Um, so that's been an interesting topic. I do not think, um, I'm not that worried about Venezuela invading Guyana. Um, there's a very large natural barrier uh, between the two countries on land, which is this massive jungle. Um, so it's really difficult to like run tanks through. I don't, I don't even think it's feasible to do something like that. I think but. the Brazilians may also have something to say about that if things were to. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's going to be a, a non-event. That's super interesting. What about Canadian refineries? Um, if you, know, you figure you got this heavy oil there, uh, have we got a decent amount of heavy oil refineries in Canada where you presumably would not have to transport that crude quite so far? No. So, you know, that's been an issue forever. I mean, when I first started covering this industry, I, I just don't think they, they built out the refining capacity um, in Canada. Like you would think like, why don't you, you got your, your oil producers are selling their crude at significant discounts um, because you can't refine it. Like, why don't you build a refinery? Um, I don't what know. Is, they haven't done it. It's, up there? Yeah, man. I don't, <laughs> I don't want to get off on, I trust me. I could talk a long time about this topic, but, um, they just, they haven't done it. There are some refineries, I think on like the East coast of Canada where they're pulling in some like uh, light sweet crude, but the refineries that are built in Canada, there might be an exception or two, um, but they're lar largely, largely designed to run the light sweet. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, <laughs> So you're, tell it, you're telling me these guys north of the border produce heavy oil. They send it down south and they flog it off at a discount. They don't build refineries for heavy oil, but on the other side, they build refineries for light sweet and they import that light sweet back over. Yeah, there. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, okay. they, yeah, you're right. But they <laughs> built these refineries so long ago. I think it okay. costs so much to build these refineries. So, I mean, I, I think they built these, these, these refineries decades ago before they even realized that they'd be producing you know a few million barrels per day oh, from the nice. oil sands yeah so it's it's a timing thing well you know if you save save some money on solar and wind you probably have a bit to spare for, uh, for refinery <laughs> in addition if exactly. a, a, maybe a natural gas export might be on the cards uh, for, for, for canada that would raise some money and then they could buy uh, and build some refiners refineries as well yeah, that's, you know, that topic, I don't, I don't want to get you too off, but yeah, there's so much natural gas in North America. Um, yeah, there's so much the LNG export. We'll see, we'll see about that. Um, that's another interesting political topic. Yeah, it is. It's crazy. You can, you can't give natural gas away, um, in America at the moment, it seems, and, but Europe could certainly do with it. I mean, we could do with it here, but we're, we're too busy making our own mistakes. Uh, all right, my friend, it's been another fascinating conversation. Uh, I want to see if I can trick you into answering a specific question and then we'll wrap it up for today. If I were to say to you right now, just as of you know, uh, where, when I'm talking the 30th of March, 2024, if you were to give me your three best ideas in terms of uh, oil service companies, 
what order would you who would you say and, and why would you give them to me in that order oh boy yeah you're catching me off guard here um i'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try i'm gonna if you don't mind i'm gonna give you uh I'm going to pick one of these that is not an oil field services company. Is that okay? Go for it. It's yeah. I mean, three, okay. three best ideas in this space. Let's call it that. So my favorite idea, and this is, you know, if you have a high risk tolerance and frontier exploration in Namibia is interesting to you. Um, I mentioned um, Galp, Chevron and Woodside um, have positions. There's a minority um, interest company called Sintana Energy that um, I've, you know, if you follow my Twitter account, I've used them. They've been such a great resource for me researching future rig demand um, off coast of Namibia. Their investor presentations are fantastic, um, uh, but they have some very exciting um, exploration and they might've just had a large discovery in, well, they might've just had a discovery. We're gonna wait for Galp um, on the Mopain wells in Namibia, um, which would be a project for them. And, um, that is a very high beta um, investment idea. Um, if you're interested in that type of thing, not everybody is, um, but as it relates to upside, that could be really good. Um, the other two in terms of oil field services companies, uh, it depends on your strategy. I really like the offshore drillers. <laughs> I, you know, uh, if, if you like Transocean, if you like Polaris, if you like Seadrill, Noble, um, Oddfjell in, in Norway, um, I like those. It depends on the strategy. If you like a lot of volatility, then Transocean. If you don't want as much and you want the, um, um, uh, the share repurchase um, protection on the downside, then, you know, Seadrill and Polaris are, are, are ones that can give you that. Um, on the third... You know, I mean, Tidewater's done such a great job um, on the OSV market. I think that just continues to do well. Um, so the OSVs, um, the reason why I like those companies and um, is OSV demand grows with, with rig demand. So the more floating rigs that are out there, the more OSVs that are needed to go out there and supply these offshore drilling rigs. And I think what you look at over the next few years and you can look at the projects and just, you know, um, see where the growth is. It's offshore floating rig demand is growing, um, which means demand for um, OSVs is growing as well. So, um, I'm, but also too, by the way, I'm a bond person. I've never managed equity money. So take these with a grain of salt. It's not really meant to be recommendations. That means, that means you're smarter than the rest of us. Though. <laughs> <laughs> but there you go. There's my, there's my uh, three... Um, ideas. No, you gave me. Uh, you've given us a lot of gold or a lot of black gold in that uh, <laughs> in that summary. I really appreciate it. Anything else you'd like to to comment on or leave us with before we wrap it up? No, that's it. It's just been great. I appreciate um, you know you inviting me back. Also, too, I watched your YouTube video probably a couple years ago before I was even on Twitter uh, tweeting about this stuff on Transocean. So oh, wow. uh, it's a pleasure speaking with you. Um, cause I remember watching your video. I mean, I don't know if it's even up anymore. Um, uh, but back when it was probably like two or three bucks a share, um, I remember watching it and, um, it's a pleasure to speak with you here in 2024, um, on the follow-up. Oh, thank you so much. Now I feel really nervous about my comments around the credit structure and the capital. <laughs> no. How many, how many mistakes did I make there? <laughs> no, I don't remember any. I think you did a good job. Thank you. I appreciate it. You're too kind. Well, it has been an absolute pleasure as always, my friend. Guys, if you're listening, please uh, follow and uh, like Tommy's content on Twitter. It's an it's amazing stuff uh, and it's really in a presentable format that's easy to follow. Uh, if you do like uh, the quality of content that uh, we're putting out here, do like and subscribe to the channel. It helps out a lot. Stay safe, guys. Wishing you all the best over the, uh, the Easter, the Pesach holiday. And I'll be back with another episode of the ROI podcast. If I can get signals somewhere in the Argentine desert, take care, guys, and I look forward to seeing you then. Bye-bye.